So I walked with him to the cage and put me in there, locked me in there. The man who gave me the opportunity to become world champion. You know you've won, it's taken away from you. It's pretty devastating. Had a fight with the cameraman there. Had some amazing experience with Shane. Traveled the world together, played poker together, drank together. One of the most special individuals I've met. He's just great to people. Great to his friends, great to his fans, and um, when he left, he left the most amazing legacy. The impact that he had, I don't think we'll ever see that from another Australian sporting person. He invited me to a, a poker tournament that he was obviously raising money for his charity, and um, I told him that I, I really couldn't go because I was training for a fight. Come back fight when I had that um, kind of an exhibition stuff with the Zuma Nelson, and I said, listen, Shane, I'm, I don't play poker and so he said, listen Jeff, you're going to come here, you're going to last an hour or so and because you've got a bounty on your head, you know, you'll be going home early because I wanted to leave early. Well, at four in the morning, I ended up winning the poker tournament, became a you know close friend of his, we played some poker together, we travelled the world together with AAA poker and um, that was the start of a, an amazing friendship. Mike Tyson, well he had these tigers and it was just crazy, I said, oh, come and see my tigers and um, so I walked with him to the cage and put me in there, locked me in there. So I'm, I was really panicking because I thought, you know, if you, get, if you show a dog you're scared, it's going to eat you, the dog will bite you. And that's why I was kind of pretty, pretty petrified at the start when I was in the cage with him. But then, yeah, thank God he um, didn't bite me and uh, ended up patting him, going for a walk with him. Got some amazing photos of me, Mike and his tigers. Yeah, I'll never forget the first day or the first time I seen Mike. I was waiting in line to, be, uh, to receive an award. I, I, I won the, the runner-up boxer in the world. Ray Leonard got, won the best boxer in the world. I won the runner-up. Mike Tyson was there and when he walked past me, he looked at me and of course I, I knew he was. I didn't think he'd know who I was. Jeff Fennick, and he started cuddling me and saying that he watched my fights and how good I was and um, ended up being his trainer, traveled the world with him and um, was one of the most special relationships I've ever had. And to this day, um, I'm quite honored to say that he's one of my great friends. Sylvester Stallone, yeah, I'll never forget. When he first came to Australia, um, I met him at South PCYC. Obviously, I was a big name back then and he was ginormous, but I remember him doing some work with the fighter who I fought, Carlos Arade, and he told me that he'd done something with him. So the shorts I fought, Carlos Arade, and I gave him to Sylvester Stallone. If he still got him, <laughs> I'd love to get him back, but no, I'm not sure if he'd kept them, what he's done with them, but um, it was an amazing experience. Um, I'll never forget watching all the Rocky movies and you know, having fights after, the, after watching the movies because I was so hyped up and stuff like that. Being able to meet him was amazing. I'm very, very close with his uh, brother Frank. We're, we're really good friends, but um, meeting Sly and being able to get some photos and be on the front page of the paper with him and all that kind of stuff was um, really, really special. Ah, Satoshi Shingaki, the man who gave me the opportunity to become world champion. Wasn't the greatest fighter I fought, but um, he was certainly one of the toughest. And um, yeah, he gave me the opportunity to fight for the world title. Obviously, um, me having my seventh fight, they thought they were going to come here and beat me. But um, it was the start of great things for me. It was my first world title. It was my first taste of fighting in a 15 round event, although it only went uh, nine rounds my first fight, but I trained 15 rounds, so it was an amazing um, opportunity for me. The IBF weren't the, the biggest and the, and, the, and the best back then, but it was an opportunity that opened a lot of doors for me and gave me um, a chance to, to be on the boxing world map. That was my first loss against the Zuma Nelson, yeah, and um, you could see how Johnny felt, I felt the same, so um, pretty empty feeling. First time I, I'd experienced um, having an L or not having my hand raised in victory, so it was it was it was pretty devastating. I wouldn't be here without him, without doubt the, the man who changed my life, who gave me direction in life, who set me goals that were achievable, and told me that if I dedicated myself to the sport, that he believed that I could do some amazing things. Like the first thing he told me, and I'll never forget, was that I could be a state champion, an Australian champion. I'd done both those things. He told me um, after I went to the World Cup that if I kept progressing that I could go to the Olympics. The year later, I represented Australia at the Olympic Games. He told me this in 1983, that if I kept doing what I was doing, that in 1985, something would happen for me. I became world champion in 1985. 
It was like that um, this guy just knew my capabilities, knew my abilities, and um, he knew that if I stayed on the right path that I could achieve amazing things in the sport of boxing, and I did. And I believed that I had this skill. I was born with the ability to fight, but whether I could have kept doing it without him and giving me the guidance, um, only God knows, but I accredit you know, my success to, to meeting Johnny Lewis. My first fight against Azuma. Again, pretty devastated with a draw because I knew I won the fight. Something I worked so hard for, and to, when you've worked hard for something and you know you've won and it's taken away from you, it's pretty devastating. And that was um, one of the most devastating things that ever happened in my life. You know, and I've you know, been through a lot of um, crazy things that have happened in my life, but that feeling there was a feeling of emptiness. And um, the sport that I loved robbed me of it. And the people who I put my trust in, uh, the, the referees, the judges, the system, robbed me. And um, look, I wasn't the first person that happened to, but it was a pretty devastating um, feeling, especially when you know that you've won at least nine or 10 rounds out of 12 to, to get a draw was pretty gut-wrenching. Had I won that fourth world title at the time, I don't believe that I would have been the person I am today. I think a lot of things would have been different. So um, everything happens for a reason, and I'm really, really delighted that I got a draw back then, and I'm even more delighted that I got the title 31 years later rather than getting it on that day, because like I said, um, I wouldn't be here with you guys today. I'm quite confident of that. Good old mate Mario Ferni. That day there in the tunnel, I had a fight with the cameraman there, got in trouble on the front page of the paper. Mario got Simbin, and of course, I went down to stick up for him. Uh, the cameras were all there, and he was telling me to get the cameras away. So I just done what my good buddy told me, and um, yeah, I love Mario. Uh, he's not uh, in a real healthy way these days. He's got uh, dementia, obviously, through repeated concussions and being the, the player that he was on the field that gave 110% every game. So, um, you know, I, I feel for him today, but like I said, um, amazing relationship and friendship with Mario Fennec that I still have. All they want to do is be a first grade rugby league player. That, that was my dream. I never dreamt of being a boxer. I never boxed in my life until I was like 17 and a bit. And my um, ambition, I played um, Matthew Shield when I was 14. I played Jersey Flea when I was 17 and 18. I wanted to be a rugby league player. That was my, that's all I ever wanted to do. I wanted to be, but I was too small. I got to play for Parramatta um, at the end of, well, during a, a break in my boxing career. And I, and I totally loved doing it, but um, yeah, I would have loved to. I'd give all my belts to have played first grade rugby league. I'd give everything away. Of me, Johnny and Jeff Harding, that was in the Australian. Um, I love the photo. I love them, um, my association, my relationship with all the boys in my gym and Jeff Harding. Um, what an amazing human he was to get a couple of weeks um, notice and go over and fight for the world title in one of the, the greatest comebacks in boxing history. Uh, Jeff Harding was a very, very special human to him. And, you know, he was one of those guys who wanted something really, really badly and he went and got it in the hardest way possible. He fought in the light heavyweight division. Um, you know, and like I said, two weeks notice, he was over in America fighting for a title that, that every judge had him behind coming in the last couple of rounds. And he, he just never gave up. He fought to the bitter end and knocked out Dennis Andres in the last round. Costa Zoo, um, wow, when he first came to Australia, we all knew that was something really, really special. And I still think that he's most probably the greatest in his weight division. I, you know, when people talk about um, Costa Zoo, you talk about somebody really, really special that took no shortcuts, worked really, really hard, and his legacy that he left is amazing. And um, his breeding of his, of his two young boys, Nikita and um, Tim at the moment, are really, really special. So um, he's... Yeah, one of the, the most um, gifted and talented fighters I'd, I'd ever seen. Without doubt, my favourite fighter of all time, apart from obviously Mike Tyson, is Roberto Duran. I love the way Roberto fought. I love everything that he um, brought to the to the game, to the sport. He was an animal inside the ring, a gentleman outside the ring, and um, I'd like to think that a lot of my traits and a lot of um, what I done was similar to Roberto Duran because I, there was a headline in one of the boxing magazines, the second coming of Roberto Duran, and it was a photo of me there. If I get mentioned in the in the same breath as him, it means I, I done something great in the sport. And to meet Roberto and to be one of his great friends, which I am today, again, makes me really proud. When you um, people think they've made it in a sport, you can have belts or you can have money, you can have everything else, but when you have respect from your peers, from the greats like Roberto Duran, Mike Tyson, Lennox and all those guys, Lennox Lewis, um, that's when you know you've made it. I, 
my, none of my builds count when Roberto Duran shakes my hand and tells me and tells somebody else how great I was. Then I believe that I'm made in the sport of boxing. Victor Kalajis, without doubt, one of the toughest guys I ever fought, without doubt. Most probably the hardest puncher I fought. I haven't met him since then. I've, they videoed him and him talking about me and they asked him about when he fought me and he said, Jeff Fennick. He said, um, when I went back between rounds, in my head I was thinking, am I fighting a human? Um, is this guy real? Because he'd hit me with so many punches and I, I was still there and he elbowed me, I'd elbow him back, he headbutted me, I headbutted him back. So without doubt he was the dirtiest fighter, but um, I look at the fight game this way. If um, I had to headbutt somebody to think that I could turn the fight around to try to win, I would do that. You know, if I had to thumb somebody down the eye to think I was going to turn the fight around to win, I would do that if I had to elbow somebody. And he'd done that to me, but I, every time he'd done it to me, I, I um, replied with the same he'd done to me. But without doubt, I could say that he was the most fiercest fighter I've ever fought in the ring, and without doubt, he'd done everything in his power to try to turn the fight around to win the fight, and then um, I didn't let that happen. Muhammad Ali, been honoured and blessed to have met him a couple of times. I'm not going to say the greatest fighter of all time, because um, I, I, I love some other fighters, but I will say um, the greatest humanitarian of all time. Anybody that can be prepared to go to jail, lose their belts, lose their livelihood, to put their hand up and, and, and speak about what they believe in, to me is yeah, most probably the greatest human I've ever lived in. Um, a one of a kind, a one of, is, will Ali ever be one Muhammad Ali? And like I said, um, people can say he's the greatest fighter, I don't, I don't want to put him in that category. I just want to say he's most probably the greatest human that yeah, God ever put breath into. Crazy, I get on the plane, sit in first class and I see Steve Owen. So we have a talk, it was really, really interesting. We spoke for a while. He was, I, mean, I was delighted to meet him, he was telling me some stories, I was telling him some stories about myself. And the craziest thing was, we got off the plane and um, I wanted to say goodbye to him, but I didn't know where he went, I couldn't even see him, so I'm thinking, wow, he's just disappeared. And just as I'm looking around, he, this guy who, within a split second, took this thing out of his mouth, and it was Steve Irwin again, we, and we put a hat on, but he had this thing that he'd put in his mouth it would, and it would change, it like change the way he looked. He'd put a hat on and you couldn't notice who he was. So it was just crazy that, um, yeah, because he was such a, a huge name in America that he would just change his identity as he walked out of the plane. But uh, it, yeah, an amazing man who, um, yeah, was again taken away way too early.